needs to be, sorry, I just got distracted there. Today promises to be an informative, educational, educational uh, event for us all. Uh, we have a wide selection of speakers to tantalize your taste buds from all things educational to all things about life. Before we get started, however, we would like to welcome God into this present, into this place, as we invite our sister, the Reverend Dr. Sorry, Pastor Dr. Alicia Aline, who's a PT Beauty member, to guide us in our opening prayer. But this is after we rise for our national anthem, sung by our own songbird, Natalie Burke. In plenty and in time of need when this fair land was young oh brave forefathers sowed the seed from which our pride is sprung a pride that makes no wanton boast of what it has withstood that binds our hearts from coast to coast the pride of nationhood we loyal sons and daughters all do hereby make it known these fields and hills beyond recall are now a very own we write our names on history's page with expectations great strict guardians of our heritage firm craftsmen of our faith the lord has been the people's guide for past 300 years with him still on the people's side we have no doubts or fears upward and onward we shall go inspired exulting free and greater will our nation grow in strength and unity. We loyal sons and daughters all do hereby make it known. These fields and hills beyond recall are now a very own. We write our names on history's page with expectations great. Strict guardians of our heritage, firm craftsmen of our faith. Blessed good evening to everyone. Let's bow our head. Oh, gracious and loving Father, we bow in your presence to give you thanks and praise for this day. 
You have been so good to us. Co continue to cover the teachers in the region under your precious blood. As we are about to do this session, we pray you will guide those who will share with us. Bless the organizers of this event as we're truly in some challenging and uncertain times and need to know how to maneuver the various trials we go through. We thank you for the trade union movement across the region. Men and women who step forward to serve the people, strengthen them and give them wisdom as they lead. Thank you for this platform where we can join together persons of like mind across the region. Into your hands, we place this session. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. 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 Thank you very much for that wonderful prayer, Dr. Felicia. Now we invite Brother Ian Marshall to introduce our first speaker. Brother, Brother Marshall. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Our first speaker this afternoon is um, Ingrid Armstrong Walker. Ingrid Armstrong Walker is a god fearing woman who loves her family. She also loves to teach and has been a teacher for 23 years. The senior teacher at Grantley Prescott Memorial Primary School is also the president of Eastern Orators Toastmasters Club. The name of her talk is Bring Them In. Please welcome Ingrid Armstrong Walker. In one of Aesop's fables, we learn that one stick can easily be broken. But when you put a bundle of sticks together, their collective strength makes them unbreakable. Aesop told that story around 500 BC, but some truths stand the test of time. Centuries later, Aesop's fable is still relevant. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed a pleasure to be here at Caribbean Teachers Talk, strengthening trade unionism amidst current global challenges. One would have thought that with all the technological advancements in science and medicine, that we would have been safe from a pandemic. But yet, here we are. A hundred years ago, after the Spanish flu, we were ill-prepared for another flu. And since we travel considerably more than we did a hundred years ago, the pandemic got a global passport. As the old adage goes, the more things change, the more they remain the same. Just like the flu has returned because we dropped our guard, unfortunately. If we in the trade union movement do not guard our rights and privileges, we could easily lose out on the many gains our predecessors fought for in years gone by. Now, I am fully aware that I may be preaching to the choir, but I will deliver my sermon anyway. It is our belief that this message needs to be carried. Very often, our younger colleagues only need to be given a little encouragement, to be given some background information to send them along the right path. Ask those younger teachers if they are members of the union. And if they are not, tell them why they need to be. Share the benefits of collective bargaining, of having representation in a crisis. And if all else fails, 
tell them that the meager fee of $20 a month is tax deductible. So they have nothing to lose and everything to gain. Bring them in. The holidays with pay that provide us with much needed rest were not always given to workers. And there are still employers today that would gladly make their employees work without vacation, far less vacation with pay. Don't let them take the trade union for granted. Our predecessors understood and fought for maternity leave. And even today, in the big able United States, there are only eight states where maternity leave is funded by the government. Indeed, you have to be employed at an understanding company in some states to get maternity leave in the US. You can get maternity leave in Canada, but the United States has no universal leave legislation like we do. Don't take our union for granted. The International Labor Organization says we all must get a luncheon hour. Unions fought for that right, so don't ever take it for granted. In Barbados, teachers are granted a term's leave after their first 15 years of service, and then every five years after that. The final period of leave is granted just before retirement. The granting of a term's leave has now changed over the past 10 years. At this point, we're only granted a term's leave at the 15 year mark and at pre-retirement. For many, that term's leave may be the difference between life and death. Since as aging takes place, we need those opportunities to regroup and catch ourselves. I pray that our union retrieves this right sooner rather than later. Because at 23 years in the service, it has been eight years since my last opportunity to have a term's leave. Let us not take the work of the trade union for granted. I want you to always remember that the court of public opinion doesn't always rule in our favor. So we have to represent ourselves. At the start of online learning, parents suddenly understood how challenging our jobs really were. But by this year, our radio personality here in Barbados leveled a broadside attack at the teaching fraternity. How do we defend ourselves without descending into that gutter? We don't need to. We are a union so we can collectively ignore those vile attacks. As I interact with my colleagues across the region, they too express their concerns. Do you remember the Vincentian teacher who described on social media how she was dismissed from her job after the new vaccine mandates were issued in that country? On another occasion, I was shocked at the level of overcrowding in some Guyanese classrooms, even though we are still in the midst of the pandemic. In some classrooms, there are as many as three pupils sitting on a small bench and over 30 pupils in the class. That teacher coughed and coughed and coughed her way through our conversation. And she believed that she contracted COVID while on the job. My Jamaican colleague and I sat on a Zoom call one night and compared our salaries. When we finally decided to calculate in US dollars, she revealed that her trained graduate teacher salary with 10 years experience is 1100 US dollars a month, which is about the same amount of money made by the janitors 
at my school. Surely that needs to be addressed. She intends to relocate to a more lucrative territory as soon as she completes her postgraduate studies. Another example of brain drain from the Caribbean. Further afield, our comrades in Belize were told that because of the challenges with that economy, they would have to endure a 10% cut for three years. Their unions fought and strike action was taken. After the action was taken, the three years was reduced to one year. And by this June, their full salaries will be restored. My Belizean colleague was able to see the light at the end of a very dark financial tunnel. Because if we are being real, many of us don't even have 5% of our salaries left back after we meet our financial obligations. Buy food, put gasoline or diesel in our vehicles. Many pockets are empty after that. As I spoke to her, I couldn't understand where this 10% would come from. But then I remembered in 1991, when Barbadian civil servants experienced a cut of 8%. Remember, I said it earlier, the more things change, the more they remain the same. All these challenges need collective action. They require negotiations for health and safety concerns or regrading exercises so that salaries can be improved. Our teachers right across the Caribbean need strong representation and we need to get our young people on board, bring them in. Because they will eventually have to be the ones to guard the rights and privileges for the next generation. Ultimately, change is inevitable. And the union has seen the need to place greater emphasis on the professional development of its constituents, as well as industrial relations, of course. We're now going to pay special attention to some additional areas of training. This is a positive direction to go in, and I applaud vision of our leaders. Our education environment is changing as well. And we cannot and should not need to impede the progress of sound planning by the policymakers in education. We should be able to embrace the new structures and policies, knowing that our interests are being well represented. And at the end of the day, we are not going to be disadvantaged. Our unions must be strong. So I have preached my sermon and I humbly ask you to embrace our younger ones and bring them into the fold so that we have the next generation ready to take guard as we face the unknown challenges ahead. I thank you. very much sister ingrid for your wonderful thought-provoking presentation she's asked us all to bring them in she's asked us all not to take our unions for granted and i think that this is a perfect time for us to bring in our union leader our president so i ask us all to clap use our emoticons and welcome Brother Rudy Lovell, President of the Barbados Union of Teachers, to offer his welcome. Brother Lovell. Good evening, one and all, brothers and sisters from throughout the region. As you would have heard just now, my name is Rudy Lovell, and I'm President of the Barbados Union of Teachers. I want to say a special welcome to the participants. Miss Ingrid Walker, Armstrong Walker from Barbados, Dr. Mark Nicely from Jamaica, Ms. Faria Haitali from Trinidad and Tobago, Mr. Anthony Allen from Barbados, 
Miss Natasha Hislock from Trinidad and Tobago. And last but not least, Mrs. Joy Adamson from Barbados. Today's event, Caribbean Teachers Talk, is being held as part of the Barbados Union of Teachers Annual General Conference, which has as its theme strengthening trade unionism amidst current global challenges. I cannot think of a better way of achieving this theme than providing a forum for regional trade unionists and young and experienced leaders to be able to express themselves verbally. I am extremely excited that the beauty was able to achieve this feat. And we hope that Caribbean Teachers Talk becomes a regular event on the beauty's calendar of events. This event is one of many that has been developed as part of the BUT's professional development drive and coincides with the, the formation of the BUT Toastmasters Club to assist in honing teachers' public speaking skills. The formation of this club is near completion. It is also heartwarming to see so many brothers and sisters joining from throughout the region. And I think this bodes well for the trade union movement. I am so elated to hear our speakers. I will hand over the virtual lectern to the Masters of Ceremonies, Miss Stacia Burroughs, to allow the event to come in, to continue. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. President. As the virtual waters flow behind me, joining all of our Caribbean islands together as one. I ask you now to just sit and relax and enjoy the musical interlude provided by the Coleridge and Parry Orchestra as they present Mama. Oh, I'm sorry, this is not the orchestra, this is the choir, I'm sorry. My name is Lamar Colley. My name is Evia Campbell. And we are singing Mama by, by Marla Lego.
you. And thank you. A little bit about the Courage and Parry School. Courage and Parry School is located in the north of our island, and it's a secondary school. Students attend the school from ages 11 to 18. That is a small selection of the students there. And I believe that they did a fantastic job. So kudos to the principal and students and teachers of the Courage and Parry School. Well done. Now I will introduce Brother Marshall again, and he will come and introduce our second speaker, Dr. Mark Nicey. Dr. Mark Nicely will be our second speaker for this evening. Mr. Nicely will be doing a piece called You. Uh, Mr. Nicely will do his own introduction. Please welcome him. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Are you all good day? Sorry, are you all hearing me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Excellent. It's it's great to be in your company, and um, I thank you for having me. Um, uh, my name is Mark Nicely. I'm the Secretary General of the Jamaica Teachers Association, and um, of course, we are the sole trade union um, representing teachers in Jamaica. We have approximately 24,000 members, and um, let's say we're going strong and we are always open to uh, Caribbean regional integration. And um, I, I look forward to this presentation. I, I, the, the, the topic for my presentation, in fact, just came about moments ago. We are just coming out of our annual education conference. It has been um, a very hectic time. We just ended a moment ago, and I'm happy that we ended so that I am kind of on time to join you. I think um, as we contemplate unionism and um, each of us as union members and advocates, I think we have to pause to look at the individuals because it's the individuals, um, each of us, uh, we make up the unit and um, our state of mind, our own welfare, our own perspectives and views and opinions um, will contribute to the whole. And so to start my discourse, I know I have 10 minutes, I'm watching the clock. Um, to start my discourse, I want to share with you a quote from Abraham Lincoln. And it says, give me six hours to chop down a tree and I will spend the first four hours sharpening the ax. And um, that is not quite the approach that persons take when they have a task. Uh, you know, you give somebody an ax and you say chop down the tree, they start chopping right away. And so I want to start off by encouraging us and my presentation will have perhaps more questions than answers. And it's really encouraging you to reflect. And so to start, I am saying to us that as union persons, we have to ensure that we are at the cutting edge of the, the knowledge of unionism, um, not just in your own territories, but it's good that we are, we are reaching out in Jamaica. I think we know about Education International. And I want to encourage us to be reading, reflecting persons. And so in terms of sharpening our acts, I'm talking about educating ourselves, uh, becoming more sensitized and aware of not just what is happening in your country, but what is happening in, in other territories, what challenges they may have, and how it is that they are overcoming those challenges. And um, reflect on if it is that you were to employ the same strategies, would you be able to get a similar result? The next thing I want to say to you is that I know that you have had successes and I want to commend you and applaud you for your successes and you know just where you are now, but I want to also say to you that every point of arrival must be deemed as a point of departure. And, and we have a situation where it can happen to any of us individually in our lives or it can happen to us as an as a organization where we get to a point where we are celebrated, we have achieved much and we tend to sit there for too long. And so I'm saying to us that the minute you arrive as a union, as individuals, 
even as you engage in school and school have various levels of successes, I want for us to embrace the concept of every point of arrival is a point of departure. So you're only arriving to depart. And as you celebrate your goals, um, you take time to do that, but then you, you start to, to move forward. I want to talk to us a little bit about maintain and build, and I'm jumping because I have a short time, so I'm giving you hopefully some nuggets. Um, maintain and build. A lot of times we, are, we talk a lot about building, and we really do not consider maintaining. But if you are building and you're not maintaining, the very foundation on which you believe you're building on is, is falling apart. So I'm encouraging you as you look at your strategic plan as an organization, where it is that you're going. And yes, you are going to have lofty goals and objectives. I want for you to spend a great deal of time looking at the, your foundation, looking at the legacy of your forefathers and ensuring that you maintain um, that aspect. I want us to, I heard about integration. And, and one of the things I think we are advocating for in Jamaica, and I see that you are doing it likewise, it's not a case of you in your small corner and I in mine. We have to share. We have to share. And when we talk about unite, a lot of us use unity. But sometimes when we think about unity, uh, you know, pardon me for saying it, we think about it in too small a way. So it's unity of Jamaica or unity. The unity that I would want to advocate is unity across the region and by extension across the world. We're all human beings. We have similar problems and challenges. And if we were to truly unite and share and partner, I think we can indeed be stronger. And we, we, are, we are not going to be in the process of reinventing the wheel. The truth is that we can all accomplish together. There is enough space, enough room for each of us to grow. I want to share with you a story about um, something that can restrict you and sap your energy. I recall when I, in Jamaica, you do your diploma and then you do your degree and then you do your master's and you go on. And when I finished my diploma, I applied to the MICA, which is one of the premier colleges in Jamaica, to do my first degree. And um, I got through and I went, I visited my mom on the day that I was supposed to do the degree. And when I visited my mom, I, she said to me, but Mark, isn't it today that you should start your, your, your degree? And I said, yes, but I have no money to start it because I needed to obviously pay the fee. And my mom said, she said to me, you know, if you wait until you have the money, you will never ever do that degree. And she left. She was mopping the floor. She continued mopping the floor. She said, if you wait until you have the money, you'll never do it. She didn't go for any money. She didn't make any promises. Can I tell you that when you have a task to do, something to accomplish, do not focus on the obstacles. Get started. Get going. I can tell you that I got up from that veranda. I went to the micro, having not paid any money, and I started the degree. And I, I am going to tell you a little bit further. When I, when, when I finished, I finished the course, I still didn't pay them all the money. I paid some, I didn't pay all the money. And when I was finished, the teachers were so excited because this was the first degree Michael was offering that the teachers or lecturers wrote the principal and said, we're asking you to allow these students to graduate. It was myself alone. And if they do not repay the funds in six months, you can take it from our salary. Now, there are many things I could tell you about that story, and, I, and I'm hoping that one of the things that you get from it is that you must be prepared to give as educators, prepared to make sacrifices, prepared to put yourself on the line in the interest of your children, but also that you must not allow the obvious um, things that could easily retard your progress to retard your progress. Go forth in faith, trust in God, and believe me, you are going to achieve. I want to just talk to you a little bit about talking to yourself. Now you have the conscious mind and you have the subconscious mind. Now the, sub, the conscious mind is, is where we're at now. And, and, and what we say goes now into the subconscious. But the subconscious is very important to know. It is what drives you what you do. So if you say in your conscious that I'm going to fail, the subconscious embraces that takes it as an instruction and help you to guarantee failure. So 
again, I can't talk too much about this, but as I talk about you, I'm asking you, appealing to you, begging you, beseeching you to send the right messages to your subconscious. Send messages of hope, of success, of achievement, of overcoming obstacles. And once you instruct your subconscious in that way, you are going to be surprised the results that you are going to achieve. Um, I, I can use, although Jamaican, Usain Bolt. I think we all know Usain Bolt. So I'm going to use him to, to make a point. Now, Usain Bolt ran a 200 meter long, long time ago. But when he ran it, he was identified as a quality athlete. Everybody, the world over, say he was quality. He, he broke the record. Astonishing. And, but, and I want to declare right now that you're all quality. We are all quality. But then there's another word that is called consistency. And, and there, it, it is said that you are as good today as what you do today. So I'm going to say to you, you are quality, but you must be consistent. You saying bold, if when he ran that um, race, he never ran fast again, he would be forgotten. By now, he would have been forgotten. The reason why Usain Bolt is remembered because he continued to run fast, right? So there is quality, there's consistency. And then I'm going to leave one more word with you, which is um, relevance. After a while, you know, even if you're consistent, if you're not changing, if you're not breaking records, which is what he did, you are going to lose relevance. And, and if you were in Jamaica, I would tell you about mackerel and, and how they have rebranded it and, and how once upon a time you had to use a knife to cut it, but now you can just pop it open. That's relevance. That's, that's, that's one way of relevance. So, so you're saying just so. And then she may so put yeah. that clip up as Right. And so I, I want to also say to you that we have a, a responsibility to our children to grow them up in the right way. You as educators and as union leaders uh, must play a role there. I, I think, quite frankly, we all have to accept that if we're not careful, we have gotten to a point of moral bankruptcy. And it can't be something that we accept or we look away. It's something that we have to put our shoulders to the wheel. But when I look at the time, my time is up, I leave you with one final story. And the final story is this, that Walt Disney is the creator of Disney World. And I don't know if many of you know that when Disney World was open, he was not alive. He had, he had passed and someone was speaking and they said, it's a pity that you know, Walt Disney did not live to see Disney World. And his wife, who was alive, went up to the podium, borrowed the mic, and said to the person and to the audience, you are wrong. It is because Walt Disney saw Disney World while we are here today. I'm going to ask you to see a bright future for yourself, in yourself, through yourself. And I believe that if we join together, with this kind of positive outlook and, um, and enhance each other's capacity. I, I said one last story. Let me leave you with one last one, just in closing. You know, I was a principal of a primary and junior high school and my mother called me one day and she said, Mark, you know, uh, the government is sending persons to be dentists in Canada. And I said, wonderful, many young persons will get a, a, um, an opportunity. She said to me, Mark, you're not understanding. I'm talking about you. I said, me? I said, I never tell you I wanted to be a dentist. I'm not going. And she wrestled with me, wrestled with me. And I'm not sure if I spoke the truth or I told a lie. I said to her, you know, mom, someone is at the door and I have to go now. And she said to me, remember this, looking in, looking out, looking better. Can I close by saying to us, as I talk to you about you, look in, look out, and look better. I thank you. I'm not hearing, we're not hearing. Oh, I'm so sorry. I said, thank you very much, Brother Mark. That was extremely good. And I was pointing out the fact that you were receiving a lot, a lot of applause and hearts and everything. And I wanted you to know that it really did speak to me. Um, I find that I'm going through Kamal Braffitt's um, poems as everyone is speaking. I'm hearing um, mother poem. My mother is a pool and now I'm hearing son poem. And 
it is beautiful and you know all of these things that link us as Caribbean people come together and I do believe that you know there's more than just this sea that separates us there's a whole lot more that connects us than what separates us so thank you very much and I definitely will take what you have said on board for sure thank you thank you all very good and we move on to our next um, item up, which will be spoken word by well-known Barbadian um, spoken word artist, Adrian Green, as he presents Emancipation. All this talk about culture could drive you mad. Especially if it feels like it's just talk and we really treating culture bad. It might feel as though we're living in a fool's paradise. It might feel like you will get frustrated. You might ask yourself, are we really emancipated? When we remember the team that sacrificed itself in 1816 in the Basa Rebellion, I know that Nafawis don't be sure if it was really worth it what they were fighting for. And many of us won't know how many more got to die before we realize that there's something greater than me. But if I could have a conversation with Bassa like Smokey, I would like to tell you, don't mind how it looks. Don't worry. Even though the plantation lingers on, progress is being made. Even though things are still the same, in many ways we've seen a lot of change. Even though the people still carry a burden, Victory is certain. Victory is more than certain. And it's not just him, Bim, from GT to TNT to Vinci, all of we in the back and over to Carnival. Keep your woman by your side, your man, your brethren, your pals. Don't just pick up any old thing. Grab up the emancipation baton and run with it. They call Bassa a killer, cause he didn't with it. But we are on Mr. General right Honorable, cause we understand why he did it. To stand up for his rights, just like Kafi, Kajo, Sandi, Chatoye. Fret not spirit of Bassa and other rebel ancestors. Emancipation is more than just a day. It is a process of growing in confidence, competence, and self-respect. Like the evolution of bashment, if you check, cause one time we would've been too stiff to have the confidence to conquer the world in the Ajin dialect. But when we show respect to the lineage and heritage that we reflect, it shows that we like we self and the can style we, call we surviving. Lego I hand, turn up the speaker, we want more reparations, call the car we truly grind. No spring garden pump fire. No more black sheep in this society. Ragamuffin locks flowing, high quality HD bumper rolling for Luma Ding, something's happening. We see in red, call we got it in the bag. Remember your history. Look back in the day and say, boy, boy, and celebrate the fact that they couldn't get we destroyed. Let the world know that we is one big, fetting, free, and emancipatory family. I hope the world ready, cause Barbados want put piece of what panda. Bam. Bam. I love you. Bam, bam. There we go. Adrian Green, spoken word artist of Barbados with a very, very fitting piece. And for those of you who are wondering, yes, Adrian Green is actually a teacher. And his piece, that piece is so fitting at this point. You do know that we are in the season of emancipation. Next week is National Heroes Day in Barbados. And if government has its way, we're having to do it down the road. But at this time, I'm going to ask Brother Ian to come back again and introduce our next speaker. Brother Ian. Yeah, so our next, <clears throat> our next speaker will be Faria Hayatali. Um, this educator hails from the beautiful island of Trinidad. She started her career as a secondary school teacher at 
Naparima Girls High School. At present, she teaches Cape Sociology, Caribbean Studies, and Social Studies. She is involved in the activities of the Trinidad and Tobago Unified Teachers Association as a staff representative and floor member on the executive. Let us now welcome Ms. Faria Hayatari, who will speak on the topic, Lessons from the Pandemic. Good afternoon, colleagues. I'm just going to attempt to right, just Good afternoon, colleagues. On a sunny Friday afternoon at 3 p.m. on March 13th, 2020, to be exact. I was packing my books and my papers to head home. I anticipated a lot of traffic and my colleague proclaimed, all schools are closed. The prime minister just said that. And my response, you lie. I wish somebody told me that afternoon to ban your belly, as they say because the difficult times were ahead for teachers, for students, and the population at large. According to UNESCO 2020, the estimates that the COVID-19 pandemic forced school closures, which affected 1.7 million children from 21 countries in the Caribbean. And that's just an estimate. I want to share another estimate. The World Bank in 2021 estimated that school closures will cost this generation globally $17 trillion in lifetime earnings. And I say that again, $17 trillion in lifetime earnings. Indeed, we are living through the most challenging time in the modern era of our education system. The unsung heroes of the education system are our teachers. I don't ever remember completing a module entitled Emergency Pandemic Remote Learning. Did you in your education program? Not me. However, teachers are lifelong learners. And the, we charted the way towards a successful execution of emergency pandemic teaching as it went into overdrive. What did I learn? I want to share this with you. The an acoustic. P-A-N-D-E-M-I-C, pandemic. P, pivot pedagogy. The origin of that term, pivot, comes from the business world. I believe as educators, we had to fundamentally change the direction of our business, as they would say, when we realized that our pre-pandemic strategies did not meet the needs of our market, the students. The teachers had to embrace teaching and learning with emerging technologies. The art and style of teaching may have changed for many of us. Flexibility became the key to surviving the pivot pedagogy approach, as I phrase it today. The ability to adapt to a changing learning environment. A, an effective approach to teaching. The importance of social emotional learning became very crucial in the emergency pandemic education approach. This is the type of outreach that was certainly needed. You could not just put on your camera and say, let's cover the objectives of today's class. 
You had to find out how are the students doing? Is everything okay? We all know that virtual classrooms with a warm teacher-child relationship supports deep learning and positive social and emotional development among students. And this is a quote from Schoenert and Wright 2017. I wanna share with you a digital tool that helped me a lot while I was in the online learning environment in promoting social emotional learning in my classroom. And it's called Peer Deck. You can Google it, you'll find this wonderful tool that allowed me to insert pre-made slides that I can customize in my um, presentations. And I was able to customize and, and also find out how were my students doing using interesting emojis, um, one of the slides included, what is draining you today? What is filling you today? And those little nuggets will help you to know how your students are doing in the pandemic and beyond. I move on to N, needs. Oh, there were so many needs from teachers to students, the parents, the Ministry of Education, CXC, everybody had needs in the pandemic. The needs of our students and educators became more apparent. As we observed the digital divide, that's it, and it unfolded upon, uh, uh, before our eyes, our students needed emotional, social, and in many cases, financial support. As their parents, we have lost their jobs. Our, and our teachers, they too needed resources, online resources, devices, technical support. I recall a colleague telling me the very first day of, online, of the online pandemic teaching experience, she cried because she simply did not know how to log on to the Zoom meeting. And those were the needs, technical support, and so on. And so what did teachers do? Oh, we continue to cut and contrive. We continue to ban our belly and make it work. And that is the strength of the region of Caribbean teachers. Using low technology, low tech tools, as they would say, to make it work. I move on to D, digital tools. The use of online digital tools and resources became very crucial as, the, as it, it laid the foundation for the successful learning environment. Many of us explored the usefulness and utility um, of these digital tools before the pandemic. But guess what? This went into overdrive during the pandemic. The exploration and, and experimentation of these tools takes time, a lot of time actually. However, I found that I was able to rely on the networks of my fellow educators who gave me advice. And it saved me a lot of time and energy. Some of my favorite tools included Peer Deck, Genially, Wheel of Names, Quizzes, and Slides Go. E for engagement. The lack of student engagement within the online classroom became very apparent, and it was a major complaint for our teachers. However, we continued to meet our children on Twitter Tweet me the answer. Send me the TikTok video with the response for your presentation. Or let's analyze that poem on Facebook. We had to change the way we engage and assess our students. M, management. I cannot express the importance of having a strong management team 
The principals who shined were the ones who were empathetic and adaptable to the changing environments. They, if you listen more, you will lead better. I inspire. Inspire what? Inspire progress. Now that the pandemic is said to be in the endemic phase, or so they say, the knowledge gained from the lessons of the pandemic has to make us better. Do we revert to the old ways or we seek the new path of progress? The things we have learned in the pandemic. C, communication and collaboration. We must communicate and work together with our stakeholders. And one important stakeholder is the trade union. Many times our trade union movement faced opposition, exclusion, and so much more. They even try to resist the process of consultation with our union. But more and more, our teachers realize the union is our strength. They represent our rights and they safeguard our interests. Consultation and dialogue is important. I want to conclude by saying we are resilient. Tough times don't last, but tough people do. And that's you, the teachers. I thank you for this opportunity to share. Thank you so much, Sister Faria. I mean, I didn't realize that ban your belly was something that all Caribbean people said. My grandmother always used to talk about banning your belly. And you know, it is these little nuggets that tell us that, as I keep saying, the sea divides us, but there's all much more that joins us together. So thank you very much for sharing. I mean, it's been a while since I've had an acrostic that, you know, did not involve a five-year-old shaking nervously as they hold the thing and try to read the map while they're still shaking. So it was really good. Your pandemic, pandemic acrostic was excellent. And I love the final part of communication. Um, someone sent you a message in the chat, so can you please attend to that? Um, right now, we're going to have a musical presentation by Cooper Dan. And this is entitled Rain.
Yes. So if we continue with what Faria was saying, bind your belly, put up with the rain because sun is going to shine again. And we're going to move warily along. Thank you very much for that lesson. I find, don't you find that our interludes are just sort of picking up a theme and moving with it? I'm just really enjoying it. And again, we invite Brother Ian to come and introduce our next presenter. Brother Ian. Our next speaker will be Mr. Anton Allen. Mr. Anton Allen is the principal of the Lester Vaughan School having pre previously served as principal, deputy principal and IT coordinator of the Dighton Griffith School. He has been in education for over 21 years and loves teaching, training and working with young people. He is a former deputy general secretary of the Barbarous Union of Teachers and secretary of the Barbarous Teachers Cooperative Credit <laughs> Union. He is also a member of the Sanjet Toastmasters and represented Barbados at regional and international speech contests. One of his personal mottos is, there is a leader in all of us. His guiding philosophy is, each one can. His topic this evening is empathy in education. Please welcome Mr. Anthony Allen. Thank you very much, Mr. Marshall. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me well. Let me start by complimenting the Barbados Union of Teachers for putting on this Caribbean Teacher Talks session really is relevant and it was nice to hear some of the previous presenters with the ideas that they would have brought. When I thought about what I would share this evening, uh, you know, as a principal, leadership came to mind and I remembered as a young teacher, when my mom was first diagnosed with cancer, I found myself having to spend a lot of time taking care of her. My principal then, I wouldn't call her name, she, she reached out to me and said, hey, I know you're going through a rough time, how can I help? And because of her support during those few months, uh, while my mom was ill, I was able to juggle what I needed to do at school and also not go through some of the stress that is associated with difficult times that we all face. And, and so the, the notion of empathy came to me because I always remember that experience and uh, in everything I do now, both as a teacher and a leader, the word empathy is usually at the forefront of whatever I'm thinking about. Now we fast forward to 2020 and all schools were closed due to COVID. We shifted to online learning, sometimes reluctantly. We started this two year process of uncertainty and let us admit the impact was felt by everyone. In essence, the world changed. And today we are essentially still battling those headwinds. And therefore we heard Faria a few minutes ago speak to the importance of leadership in managing what we went through over the last two years. And I wanted to first say that leadership exists at all levels. In other words, every teacher is a leader, senior teacher, head of department, principal. As long as you play a role in education or in trade unionism, you can consider yourself a leader. And over the years, there's been much debate whether leadership or management is needed, what type of leadership is best. And we learned to the hard way that leadership is needed in times of crisis. So the question that was asked, when they started to put this together is what is needed most right now? What is needed most right now? Is it computers? Is it technology? Is it money? Uh, I believe with all my heart that empathy, colleagues, empathy is one of the things that we need most as we come out of the COVID pandemic. Now, empathy is the ability to share and understand another person's state of mind, meaning you're able to put yourself in their shoes. You, you experience their outlook. And one writer said it is a powerful communication skill that is often misunderstood and underused. A powerful skill often misunderstood and underused. Recently in Barbados, we had a strong push towards the introduction of emotional intelligence or uh, emotional EQ, we called it. Many teachers, we went to a lot of workshops and we got to understand what it means to manage our own emotions and manage how we feel no matter what is going on around us. And empathy is a narrower subset of that. And for sure, for sure, it is absolutely key for us to function in society and most definitely function within a school. Now, there are some that are going to tell you, no, 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 you don't need empathy. You just need to tell people what to do and that's it. They will say it's not needed. They say, oh, if you're empathetic, you're soft. You know, you're not really a leader. Some will say it does not lead to results. Some may even say that 
Your feelings are not important. You just need to get on with it. Get there for 8.45, finish, get the job done. And then there are a few that may even say the end result is the only thing that matters. I want to tell you that all of that is like our lives. It's not true. I think all of us have been through some type of personal or emotional experience at some time, but definitely over the last two years. And therefore, we need more than ever to realize that our schools represent society. Every family, every community, every country throughout the region has been rocked by COVID. If we're going to change and go through reform, we have better understand people and how they feel. Because all of us, everyone has gone through something. And the prayers that we use sometimes at my institutions, we, we are facing the same storms, but sometimes we face them in different boats. All right? We're not all in the same boat. So when we talk about productivity and processes and performance and progress, these are words as educators we are all too familiar with. We hear them often. But at the heart of all of these things are people. In essence, if we spend too much time focusing on the end result, we are not going to spend enough time focusing on the people that lead us to that end result. And therefore in our classrooms, in our admin teams, our meetings, and even throughout the education systems on a whole, uh, the trade union movement, et cetera, we have to put people at the center of the reform and the recovery process after COVID-19. And from a psychological perspective, um, we know of Maslow's hierarchy of needs and all of us needs to feel fulfilled. If you don't feel fulfilled, we're, we're not going to be very happy. If you don't feel respected, we're not going to be very happy. And if you don't feel as if we belong, we're not going to feel very happy. And uh, we're all human and we all have feelings. So there was a study, Chris Westwall in Forbes.com, he would have mentioned that while people regard empathy as a soft skill, true leaders see the power inside of deeper understanding now more than ever. At its core, empathy is about understanding, being able to see the world from other person's viewpoints. And importantly, without it, teams break down, leaders lose respect, individuals are not recognized and potentials go unrealized. In other words, this is an absolutely critical trait we need in our educational journeys, wherever we are within the levels of the education system. Um, Tracy Bauer, Forbes as well, said that empathy has always been a critical skill for leaders, but it is taking on a new level of meaning and priority. Far from being a soft skill, it can drive significant results. Now, some of you may have seen this quote. We hear it a lot. Teachers are at the heart of education recovery. And if you are here this evening, you believe that, type amen in the chat, type it's true, type yes, I agree. Because we hear this, but oftentimes I don't know if we all feel it, yeah? And if as teachers, we do not say to ourselves and to each other and remind ourselves that we have been through one of the most difficult times these last two years and we are here still standing as schools and as a trade union movement. We teachers are at the heart of education recovery and we need to say it to ourselves over and over again. But there are some realities that we have to face, whether we like it or not. And if anything I say here applies to you, just give me a thumbs up using the reaction button if you can. I'm, I'm tracking if persons are listening and, and what you're feeling out there. So declining mental or physical health over the last two years. Burnout. Fatigue, stress or anxiety, feelings of underperformance, either real or perceived, personal life issues, and maybe in some cases, trauma. And of course, deadlines, deadlines, deadlines. If you have ever experienced any of these, by all means, just thumbs up because they want everyone here this evening to recognize the one thing COVID taught us, we are not alone. Uh, we're here as a trade union movement and solidarity is the key. So we are not alone in what we are going through. So there was a workplace study that looked at some of the benefits of being an empathetic leader or a teacher. And just quickly in the time remaining, they said innovation. More persons felt more innovative with an empathetic leader or teacher. More persons felt engaged felt more respected, felt more willing to persevere. Inclusivity was at an all time high when the teacher in the class or the leader of the school 
promoted that type of empathetic environment and importantly, the work-life balance. 87% of persons felt more empowered to juggle their personal challenges and their professional responsibility. The key thing that we want in our education systems and schools. So there is a role for the empathetic leader and the empathetic teacher. But just a quick word of caution. It is okay to say want to be empathetic, but it is not always easy to be empathetic. As I said, we're human. So it will take some time. Some people may not see it as necessary. And I'll be honest, in a moment of confession, it may come back to bite you. You know, we heard a, a phrase earlier uh, but by anybody and in Caribbean terms, you know, sometimes you're nice to persons, you treat them really well, and you expect that they will feel it and give it back, and then the complete opposite thing happens. And that's a reality, but that is part of our noble profession and uh, the vulnerability that we feel once we're building relationships. So do not let it stop you. So empathy is a gateway to unlocking results, building relationships, strengthening culture, building trust, and most importantly, fostering positive and nurturing environments in schools, in classrooms, and across all organizations, including the Barbados Union of Teachers. I will put it to you, Nelson Mandela said that education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. And I go a little further and say that trade unionism or solidarity is the most powerful weapon that we can use to shape education in the months and the years to come. So if you're interested in building empathy, just a few quick tips. One, listen, pretty simple, but listen. Watch out for signs of burnout in your colleagues. Show sincere interest, not mock interest, sincere interest. Consider the impact of other person's problems, show compassion and always ask yourself, if this were me, what would I want? and try to do the best you can, regardless of the outcome. Uh, my wife watches New Amsterdam, so I have to. And he always asks this question, how can I help? This is the approach that we have to take as we move past COVID and into uncertain challenges ahead across the region. How can I help? And I would just want to say in the few seconds left that all of us are leaders. Doesn't matter if you're a new teacher, experienced teacher, senior or not, principal or not, all of us are leaders. All of us are human. All of us at heart, they truly believe, want to succeed. But then all of us, we do know, have challenges. And all of us can be empathetic if we choose to. And remember, before we are professionals, we are people, regular, ordinary people trying to do a noble and needed job. So empathy is not a weakness. It is simply another tool that can be purposefully built, used to build relationships, sorry, foster caring environments, and generate positive results at all levels in all spaces. And to sum it up in the words of Theodore Roosevelt, no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. And as we strengthen our trade union movement, as we try to build our schools and support our students, let us put into practice this notion of caring and empathy in all we do because the results are profound and they will last much longer than we can ever imagine. Well, colleagues, I thank you and I wish you all the best for the rest of the afternoon. Thank you, Brother Anthony. That was a phenomenal. I mean, I just keep using the word phenomenal. I mean, I, I think we're now at the point of saying that was hippopotamously wonderful and great. And, you know, we're going to have to start using these sorts of um, words to describe what, what I'm saying, what I'm hearing, what I'm feeling. Um, it was totally phenomenal um i know i'm going to probably get slapped for my sentence structure i'm very sorry i apologize i uh, i hang my head in shame but that was hippopotamously awesome and at this point i am going to just take our take us into our next musical interlude which is being presented by natasha you have a question Oh, sorry. Okay, so we're going to go into our next. We're going into our next musical interlude, which is being offered by a teacher, another teacher. Um, this is Kevin Jack, and he is doing a cover from um, Marve's. Hold on, actually. Push and go through. Push and go through. 
nothing is moving on my computer right now, but I'm guessing you can hear me. So here we have Kevin Jack is fighting traffic, push and go through. <laughs> Well done, push on go through by Marve being performed. That cover being performed by Kevin Jack. And it just keeps that whole trend, that whole theme going on of Banya Belly and Go. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. Teachers, we got this. And um, I'm gonna invite Brother Ian up, and he's going to he is going to introduce our next. I am just going to predict totally awesome uh, presenter, and she's already smiling. I've just been enjoying her smile the whole evening. Uh, Brother Ian. Our next presenter is Natasha Hislop, Trinidadian. Natasha Hislop is currently a history teacher at the San Juan South Secondary. She is presently the secretary for St. George East of the Trinidad and Tobago Unified Teachers Association. She's an avid hiker and photographer who enjoys traveling and exploring African heritage. Her topic for this evening is strengthening trade unionism amidst global challenges. Please welcome Natasha Hislop. Hi everyone. I never surrender, I never surrender, we've been here for a very long time and we never surrender. Union gives strength. That's a quote by Aesop. And I found that it was poignant and profound and, you know, well, you know, it, 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 it's perfect for today. <laughs> all right? So I want you all to remember, never surrender, okay? Now, the word strength, just think about it, strength. Just think about the word. When we hear that word, um, a lot comes to mind. 
But if we go for, to the Oxford Dictionary, what we will learn is that it is defined as the capacity of an object or substance to withstand great force or pressure. Never surrender. Great force or pressure. Strength. Just three words. Think about the capacity of trade unions. Yeah. Trinidad and Tobago. All right. We have the Unified uh, Teachers Association. We have in Barbados. All right. Our Barbados Union of Teachers. If we just think about Jamaica, we have the Jamaica Teachers Association. We think of the Caribbean Union of Teachers. We think about joint trade union movement. So many of our trade unions, whether it is in locally in Trinidad or in the Caribbean, and if you want to go, we could go internationally, all right? Have that capacity, that strength, that tenacity, all right? To be able to stand and to withstand great force of pressure. Essentially, strength is the capacity of people our workers, employees, all right? Our teachers, think about it. You all are here today. Can I get amen? <laughs> all right, we are members of trade unions and we have been able to withstand great pressure. Think about it, great pressure. We have been able to withstand great force because we're still here today, all right? And we are able to look at the fact that in the midst of global challenges, the union still standing. Think about that, strength. Let's listen to the word strength again. What does S stand for? I dare you think about stability. What does T stand for? Tenacity. What does R stand for? Robust. E for effectiveness. N for numbers, because we need that in trade unionism. G for growth, because we can't be stagnant, yeah? and T for tolerability, and H for hardiness. Think about that word, strengthening. Let it resonate. It speaks of the capacity of our trade unions, whether it's national officers, whether it is, well, for instance, I could give you all with Tutor in Trinidad and Tobago. We have our Central Acts, our General Council. We have our ACOD. We have our DSRA. And we go right down to the membership. Because the membership is where our strength, the membership is where our strength lies. And we are all members, and I hope you are. And if you are not, at the end of this presentation, I hope you join the union <laughs> in your country. And if your country does not have one, be an advocate for change. And you be the change that you want to see in this world, yeah? <laughs> all right, so think about it, strengthening. That we, we need to stand collectively, we need to stand collaboratively because we need to understand that there is strength in our numbers, that as a union or as unions per se, we are formidable force. Yeah? Can I get an amen? Find you all too quiet in here, you know? <laughs> you know, you could unmute in my presentation and, you know, say something, man. I don't like the quiet. I tell my students. Amen. Same, but, uh, amen. I like engagement. Amen. Participation. Yeah. Comrades, I dare you. You know, unmute. <laughs> So I want you to think about trade unionism. We looked at the word strengthening and strength. Think about trade unionism. I called some trade unions earlier. If we're looking for a standard definition, we might say that trade unions are organizations which were formed by workers from related fields that work for the common interests of its members. If we're looking at the word again, trade unions, we will realize that in terms of its purpose or objective, it would be to help workers in issues like fairness of pay, good working environment, hours of work and benefits. Barbados Trade Union. Yeah, make some noise for Barbados Trade Union. Could you put your hands together for Barbados Trade Union people? Jamaica <laughs> Teachers Association. Could I hear you make some noise for this trade union? Caribbean yeah. Union of Teachers. I'm not hearing you all. You're not too quiet in this place. Yeah. Joy trade union movement. I'm not hearing any noise. Well, yeah. I would say teachers, Trinidad and Tobago. All right, teachers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, teachers. T T U T A, Tuta, Trinidad and Tobago United Teachers Association. Yes, they work hard. And I'm happy to be a member of that trade union. And I will vigorously work to ensure that I see change and that there is growth. I want us now to look at the context of current global challenges. Yeah, y'all, we're facing so much. Some of us feel so burnt out. Some of us, we have challenges with our family, we have health challenges, but in the midst of all of that, we see globally a commonality. And what is that commonality? Let's look at the economic aspect. 
Food prices rising. Fuel prices rising. Just to reach the Shabonas, now it's what? About $13. So if somebody, just, you know, when I just found them to go certain places and the fuel prices is raising, and you all know it's a domino effect. Once food prices, fuel prices go up, grocery going up, and everything else will follow. And what is happening to our salary? Same level. Since 2014, Trinidadians, for I, you know that. Last negotiation period that we got some money. I was so happy in 2015. I invest and I spend some, you know, enjoying it because I waited so long. And look at it. Look how many years we are now in 2022. And this is something that is not just exclusive to the trade unions in terms of teachers' trade unions. This is all across the board. And you're hearing government saying, we don't have no money, the treasury empty. And people are asking themselves, where are we going to move forward if the salary stays the same, but everything else is rising, forcing persons into situations that, you know, I don't even want to think of the negative connotations, all right? Unemployment. What about contract workers? I have an aunt, ECCE, and they are so grossly underpaid. But worse than the underpayment is the fact that they are on contract. My aunt right now is working at her school, her preschool, at ECCE center. And at that early childhood center, you know, what is she's faced with? She's currently, her contract has not been renewed right now. And she has gone out Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday of this week because she loves her children. But at the end of the day, she's on the breadline. She has three children there at university who's doing, a, one doing a master's and the next two doing their degree. How is she to survive? She has a husband, yes, but again, it's used contract workers. So these are some things that we are facing in terms of the economics. Recently, I was chatting with some friends and they were really complaining. They was like, oh God, but you see that word, ban your belly that Faraya used earlier? Black said it and may his soul rest in peace, a great icon. Ban your belly, it is so true because tough times are ahead. And we know it's a challenge for our trade unions because you have to negotiate. But when you are hearing your finance minister say, go back to the table, we don't have the finances. What the, the union now is forced with their hands tied. What do we do? How do we move forward? Think about that. All right. I have an uncle. Every time you're watching the news, you can't talk. <laughs> you can't even laugh because he does not want interruption. All in his news are what? International news, local news, regional news. Shh. Very quiet. He was complaining. The war that is going on. All right. We know that there's a domino effect. Yes, we might say, well, oh gosh, that's so far away, Ukraine and Russia, but it was spill over economically. It must have, history always repeats itself. So there is going to be repercussions for us in the Caribbean. All right, let's look at the fact that there's COVID-19, pandemic or pandemic, depending on if you want to go with conspiracy theory or not. All right, there's loss of life, vaccine, anti-vax issues, fears, depression, so much things occurring. You know, all the technical issues, the fact that you have to go out face to face, you're wearing your mask, a lot of problems, all right, that we are faced with. How do we strengthen our trade unionism? How do we mitigate the global challenges? I dare you to look at education sensitization programs. There's an urgent need for us to educate people on trade unionism, on activism, on the history of trade unionism and its relevance. Look at this forum that we're in here today. Isn't this an excellent initiative? I dare you to think about this Caribbean teacher's talk with its 2022 team. Isn't this evidence of a collaborated and concerted effort to bring awareness and gain strategies to the way, on the way forward? You could put your hands together for the, organ, you know, for the Caribbean <laughs> teacher's talk. I think they have done a phenomenal job. What about recruitment? We need to have recruitment drive as a trade union so we could be so that we can remain relevant. We have so many young persons who are disenfranchised, they, they, so I should say disenchanted, all right? And we need to be able to inspire them to join the union, to volunteer their service, to share their ideas, to promote trade unionism with transparency should be our goal. And we should have a renewed vigor to encourage participation and to have a beautiful new image. Think about the fact that, you know, collaborated efforts. We need to be able to, you know, 
like we are, we, we mentioned earlier, all the various trade unions in the Caribbean, we need to come together concertedly, all right, with a concerted and a collaborated effort with, some, with, with more of, of these initiatives so that we can be able to address the issues that we are facing. Let's look at the fact, I'm wrapping it up. <laughs> I see now, <laughs> no point huh? for time. <laughs> Let's look at advocacy for curriculum reform. It must be done at the primary level. We shouldn't only be teaching children about trade unionism when it's a labor day approaching, please. It should be on the national curriculum so that the children from very early learn about the history, learn about advocacy, so that when they finish school, they are able to quickly join unions and be able to bring their ideas to the forefront because they're not to you, all right? Similarly, at the secondary level, it shouldn't only be in, this, you know, in social studies that this thing is being taught. It should be something that you know, drives the students. Why can't we have the trade union leaders visiting classrooms with sessions, lecturing our students? Ideas to move forward. Resource materials for primary and secondary school. We have so many education officers in all the trade unions. They could come together, form a group, establish protocol, and be able to provide the resource materials that can be you know, sent and shared to the primary schools. So I endorse all of these things. We shouldn't just wait for when children leave school and reach university level to be able to have advocacy and when they are workers, all right? And last but not least, we must adopt realistic programs. Banks and other financial institutions have been doing this for a few years, and, all right? where they encourage programs on financial literacy. It's time that we start something like this in our primary schools, our secondary schools, all right? So that we could see the change that we want to see in this world, according to Gandhi. And as I end off, you know, I mentioned Blacks earlier. <laughs> Blacks are, Black sang with Black Star. It's not a song, it's a 2022 song. And a lot of people may not have heard it. And it's called Voyage. And he sp spoke about everyone has a journey. Amidst pitfalls, global crisis, it is the time, it is the time. The time is ripe for trade unions to shine. We should, you know, watch these challenges and move with force and, and understand that we need tenacity to be able to withstand it and to come up with solutions to move forward. We must be the change we want to see in this world. To our union be true. As I conclude, Remember, our union gives us strength. I thank you. Well done, well done, well done. I believe now TNT is the land of, I don't want to say, but I really do want to say, TNT is the land of the acrostic. And I love it. I really, really love it. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sister Natasha. That was wonderful. I know you had a lot to say and you really brought the energy. You really um, brought it in. Um, I realize that Faria has renamed the theme of this to Ban Your Belly, but um, I'm really enjoying it. And right now we're going to see the products of some of our labors. We're gonna, as we join the Daryl Jordan School Steel Pan Orchestra, ah, as we hear them uh, make a presentation, they're gonna be performing sometimes by lead pipe. I hope you enjoy.
All right. Well done. And I'm gonna say well done. I'm wearing red. I'm speaking behind a, um, a trini. I'm gonna say well done. Faria, what do you think? I'm having hearts from uh, Natasha. What do you think? Nothing? Okay, fine. Natasha, I'll take yours. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. That was wonderful. Everyone here from Daryl Jordan, um, please give them our wonderful, our greatest thanks. Um, that was a wonderful presentation. Let them know that an authentic, an authentic Trini sent them hearts. A fake Trini said, job well done. I know we're going to introduce, now we're going to ask Brother Ian to come last time to give um, an introduction to our last presenter this evening, Brother Marshall. Our last, teacher, our last presentation this evening will be Mrs. Joy Adamson. Mrs. Joy Adamson has been in education for the past 35 years. She's a trained teacher who spent 13 years collectively as a teacher of science and biology at the Princess Margaret Secondary School and at Common Mirror School. At the latter school, she also served as deputy principal and acting principal. For the last 21 years, she has worked at the Ministry of Education and is currently the deputy education officer with responsibility for all schools and student services. Mrs. Adamson is an active member of the Church of Holy Trinity, where she's a member of the parochial church council. She's also a distinguished Toastmaster who has risen to the top post of district governor for this Caribbean district. She's passionate about public speaking and presentation skills. This evening, this distinguished Toastmaster and educator will share on the topic, lead by example. Please welcome Mrs. Joy Adamson. At this point, I would like to um, interject. Thank you very much, um, Brother Ian. I just want everyone to know that um, Mrs. Adamson's presentation is actually a recording. And that is, we actually had a conflict where she's taking part in a press conference as we speak. So she wanted to send her best wishes and she has, um, this has been pre-recorded. One fine day, two crabs came out from their home to take a stroll on the stand, a mother and a child. The mother said, child, your walk is very crooked. You should be walking straight forward without twisting from side to side. The child responded, yes, mother, but please show me how. I have only been walking the way you do. Leading by example is the best route. Mr. President, executive members of the Barbados Union of Teachers, distinguished listeners all, good evening. The story of the two crabs points to the importance of leading by example. And this evening, I want to share some tidbits on why as educators, it is important that we lead by example. Example is more powerful than percept, that is, than a general rule intended to regulate behavior or thought. Nobody likes it when you ask them to do something that you cannot do or that you do not do yourself. We have all heard the phrase, be an example for others, but what does that mean for the way others perceive us and the way we perceive ourselves? It means a lot. As teachers, as educators, you have to be examples to your students. As a member of a management team, you have to be an example to the other teachers and staff. As a principal, you have to be an example to all of your staff members, teaching and non-teaching. As a PTA president, you have to be an example to the other parents. And may I dare say, as a responsible adult, you have always to lead by example. Now we tell older children to be an example to younger children. And we tell people who have done inspiring things that this serve as a good example to all of us. But to be an example at all times to all people takes a whole new level of conscious effort in every aspect of our lives. Life is unjust and unfair 
if your perception is focused only on the outcomes of your efforts. To change that perception, one needs to understand the concept of efforts and outcomes. Our daily actions therefore define us as it charts the path of our progress. That small act that we do daily adds up to make a big impact on our growth. The unpleasant thing about this is that others perceive us based on our outcomes. You know, ladies and gentlemen, we are judged based upon the results we produce and not the actions that we put in. The limelight that success enjoys has put a dark spot on the failure. Unfortunately, society does not reward for trying, only for winning. However harsh it sounds, this is the reality that has forced us to change our perception of winning and losing. That is the reason that we want to win in our every act. We look for solid outcomes from our every effort. We want instant results for our minutest actions. When results fail to match our expectations, we give in or we call it quits. This might be the reason why many prefer mediocrity over doing something more challenging. And I challenge you all listening today not to fall into this habit. It is not about winning all the time. Fear of losing out and being called out by society because of that failure has forced many to throw up their hands and feel unworthy. As a past teacher, I am challenging you not to throw up your hands. Press on. Be proud of your return on investment in the children and the teachers that you supervise. That student, that teacher, that parent who you worked with and who you, by your caring example, you have seen growth, continue to work with them. Because the effort that you put in today might not be visible in the result column today, but it is adding up for sure to reflect collectively in that result column over time. I urge you to believe in the process. Give it 100% and continue to optimize, to not give up. Great things take time. The words of Robert Louis Stevenson offers a perfect analogy for this situation of being a good example. And he said, don't judge each day by the harvest that you reap, but by the seeds that you plant. Teaching, educating is an act of planting seeds every day. You don't see them ready for the harvest in a moment. It takes time for that seed to grow, for that plant to get bigger, for that fruit to ripen before you can harvest. If you just focus on planting and everything being perfect, carefully choosing the seeds you want, the soil that you want, where you're going to plant it, the harvest will come. But if you focus too much on these little things, you will miss out on the opportunities to improvise when you've planted. Teachers, I want you to be creative in the design of your classes because every seed that you have will be different. Educators, I want you and administrators to be creative in your approaches to managing. You cannot choose the staff that you have. You cannot choose that seed all the time. So you have to look at what you have and be creative in your approach so that you will reap results. As a leader, you have to lead others by your example. The way you dress, the way you wear your mask, and like that crab, the way you walk, how you speak. Yes, I know we are a republic, so persons might not want me to say to use the Queen's English. Use UK English. There is a place for Bajan, but you must be able to discern when and where. As teachers, as educators, you have to lead by the example. You always have to show the right thing to do. Unfortunately, people will judge you even outside of that school environment. I once saw a saying which stated that children will choose their ears, close their ears to advice, but open their eyes to an example.
So you have to be a good example. Because the children will go home and they will say what happened in the classroom. They will say what happened when they saw the principal interacting with a teacher or a member of staff. Teachers will go home and they will share how the principal spoke to them or spoke to somebody else. Remember that a good example has twice the value of good advice. We need to lead by example. Children need to learn to model good behavior and they need to see how we do it. As a teacher, as an educator, you are always on show. When I go out, Joy Adamson, when I leave my home, I am being judged, even if I just go to the supermarket. It comes with the territory, and I want all teachers and educators to remember that. It comes with the territory. Ladies and gentlemen, be a good example. Lead by example. Be reminded that the small act that we do daily adds up to make a big impact on our growth and the growth of those we lead. Yes, we will be judged based upon the results that we produce. And if you want good results, be a good example. A good example is the best sermon. And therefore, I want to leave you with a poem entitled, Sermons We See by Edgar Albert Guess. I'll rather see it a sermon than hear one any day. I'd rather one should walk with me than merely tell the way. The eyes a better pupil and more willing than the ear. Fine counsel is confusing, but examples always clear. And the best of all the preachers are the men who live their creeds, for to see good in action is what everybody needs. I soon can learn to do it if you let me see it done. I can watch your hands in action, but your tongue too fast may run. And the lecture you deliver may be very wise and true, but I'll rather get my lessons by observing what you do. For I might misunderstand you and the high advice you give, but there's no misunderstanding how you act and how you live. When I see a deed of kindness, I am eager to be kind when a weaker brother stumbles and a strong man stays behind just to see if he can help him then the wish grows strong in me to become as big and thoughtful as I know that friend to be and all travelers can witness that the best of guys today is not the one who tells them but the one who shows the way one good man teaches many men Believe what they behold. One deed of kindness notice is worth 40 that are told. Who stands with men of honor learns to hold his honor dear. For right living speaks a language which to everyone is clear. Though an able speaker charms me with his eloquence, I say, I'll rather see a sermon than to hear one any day. Lead by example. Master Sermonies. Me. Well, thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, thank you very much for, hey, fire is at a heart. Um, Again, I go back to the waters behind me, the waters that unite us all. Today, we have gone from Jamaica in the north. I mean, yeah, I'm in Barbados in the east. And we went down to Trinidad and Tobago. But in, our, in everything that went on, we remembered, we went as far west as Belize. We remembered Suriname, we remembered Cayman, we remembered us all who are all joined by this water. And the water not only separates us, but it binds us together. And our last, presenta our last presentation spoke about the crowd. How do we tell one crab for another. How do we tell a boy from a girl? We have to look at the what? 
Come on, somebody tell me. You got to look at the belly band. And it tells us all that we just need to band our bellies and celebrate the things that join us together. At this time, just remember that I'm just the, um, the MC, sorry. Um, I will invite Sister Sharice Rock to proffer the vote of thanks. Sister Sharice. Master of Ceremony, Sister Stacia Burroughs, President of the Barbados Union of Teachers, Rudy Lovell, and members of the Barbadian Union of Teachers Executive, Feature speakers, members of the Beauty Professional Development and Research Committee, beauty members, teachers, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It gives me great pleasure to move the vote of thanks for the Barbados Union of Teachers inaugural Caribbean Teachers Talk series. I would first like to thank God for allowing us to be able to conduct this workshop. Thanks to Sister Natalie Burke for ably singing the National Anthem of Barbados and Pastor Dr. Alicia Ali for the opening prayer to officially start the workshop. Thanks to our president, Brother Rudy Lovell for his welcome and to Brother Ian Marshall for introducing the speakers this evening. Special thanks to our future speakers, Ingrid Armstrong Walker, who invited us to bring them in. She emphasized the importance of collective bargaining. And if I were not part of a union, I would be running to get an application form in. Her demonstration of the breaking of one state and the difficulty in getting the same result the stack of states was indeed impactful. Dr. Mark nicely spoke about you. His quote about the acts resonated with me. We need to sharpen our axes before we begin any task. He finally implored us to look in, look out, and look better. I so agreed with Faria Haitali that teachers are the unsung heroes of the pandemic. Ban your belly and go on. Her lessons from the pandemic were summed up using the acronym PANDEMIC. P, pivot pedagogy. A, effective approach to teaching. N, needs. D, digital tools. E, engagement. M, management. I, inspire progress. C, communication and collaboration. And T, tough time. No, sorry. Pandemic ended with C, sorry. She ended by saying that tough times don't last, tough people do. Anthony Allen spoke about empathy. For him, it is what we need most. We are facing the same storms, but in different boats. And indeed, I may add, some of us don't even have a boat. We may have a raft or be clinging to a log. People must be at the center of recovery. Natasha Hislop, our sister from Trinidad, invited us to never surrender and to the fact that unity is strength. Teachers have been able to withstand great pressure. She too gave an acronym, but I did not get all of the letters. I got the R for robust, N for numbers, G for growth, and H for hardiness. I'm sure she will share those with us again. She underscored the importance of joining a union and called for renewed vigor in the movement. Our culminating speaker, Joy Addison, shared why we as educators should lead by example. She challenged us not to throw up our hands in defeat, to believe in the process as great things take time. In the words of, in the words of Robert Louis Stevenson, then don't judge each day by the harvest you reap, but by the seeds that you plant. Plant a seed today through your examples. For their contributions on our theme, strengthening trade unionism amidst global challenges. Hey. I, am, I am facing my own challenge here. So the Courage and Power Secondary School Choir singing mama, 
to German, Coco Dan Gittins, every L is not a loss. Sometimes it's a lesson in his song Rain. To Kevin Jack with his guitar rendition of Marvin's Push and Go Through. And Daryl Jordan's secondary school orchestra is sometimes. And Adrian Green with his spoken word piece, Emancipation. A special thank you to all of them for allowing us to use their work to assist us ably with our workshop. To our public relations officer, Sister Marsha Burke, thank you for your behind the scenes work this evening, ensuring that our speakers kept time and that the transition videos were shown. And finally, to the members of the Professional Development and Research Committee, thank you for your hard work and commitment to ensure that this inaugural event became a reality. If there is anyone I may have inadvertently omitted, please accept my apology knowing that we are indeed grateful for your contributions. I will leave you with the words of our Master of Ceremonies, Sister Stacia Burroughs. The sea divides us, but so much more unites us. Thanks to each of you for uniting with us this evening for Caribbean Teachers Talk. I thank you. Thank you, Sister Cherise. Thank you. I'm still working, right? Okay. So everyone, thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for bringing your energies. Thank you very much for taking the last few hours of your Easter break. Those of us in Barbados who are still on break, thank you for spending that time with us. Thank you for making the choice between press conference and us, you know, CBC is gonna repeat it because they need the content. Thank you all for being here. And what can I say? I think we should do this again very, 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 very soon. And remember, we're teachers, we chose this. It doesn't always look pretty, but this is our lot in life. So what do we have to do? Keep your eye on the end of the channel where the light is. Find your belly. Let's do this. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Oh, I don't Bye. Know. I'm still on YouTube. Bye.